Hello, this is Ukrlife TV and we continue our broadcasting from Kyiv and our guest today is Glenn Grant. He is a famous military and defense expert. He is a former colonel in British Army. He is a defense expert in Baltic Security Foundation and he is a lecturer of Riga Business School. Mr. Grant, hello and thank you so much to be with us today. Thank you very much for asking me. Mr. Grant, the Ukrainian offensive continued, but perhaps we could make some conclusions about the situation on the battlefield. How you understand the situation in Ukraine? Mm, I mean, we, <clears throat> it's different in different places. I think that that needs to be to, to be said. Um, down south, then the the. the, the the main offensive, which was from in the Zaporizhzhia region and, and south from that, that has been extremely hard, um, hard and bloody, and uh, and slow and slow because of the uh, the mines, because of the uh, the heavy amount of trenches that were dug, and <clears throat> generally because the, the the Russians put quite a lot of soldiers there, so it's just been hard, bloody fighting. But the boys are, I mean, they're doing a remarkable job. And they are moving forward and moving forward slowly but steadily. Um, and uh, unfortunately, with with a lot of casualties, which is the the, the sad thing. Um, at Kherson, then then the, then the um, troops have crossed the river. And this is extremely uh, risky move because they don't actually have uh, much in the way of uh, boats to be able to take people across. And uh, it's not clear yet whether they have the ability down there uh, yet to, to start moving armoured vehicles across. Um, if they do, then uh, Russia could actually be in deep trouble because this effectively in Kherson, it, much of it is behind the main trench lines. So it, it actually could provide a, a, an opportunity for the, for the troops to, 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 to break, to, to, to cut off effectively. Um, the, the, the Zaporizhny front uh, of the Russians. We, we wait and see how that goes. It's, it's very, very thin information at the moment, but it looks, it looks as though the, the breakthrough on, on, over the river is, is I'm not going to chance my arm and say completely solid, but it looks as though it's possibly solid for the moment. Um, on the east, in the east, then Russia has been piling troops into Avdiivka, uh, around the sides of it, and and with not much success. Although, although to be fair, they are moving forward in in some places step by step, but they've lost a huge amount of troops. I mean, it's been uh, the, the 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 losses in the last couple of weeks has been a, a, have been as high, almost as any day in the war. So you know, up to a, up to a thousand Russians killed. Um, and Russia keeps pushing troops there, and it's it's difficult to understand uh, why they think they can break through there. But they obviously do think. Oh, well, either they do think, or they've been ordered by Putin to break through, so there is no choice. Um, but 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 the, the 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 brigades that are there, the Ukrainian brigades, are holding on extremely well. Um, the challenge across the whole of the front is is resources. Um, everybody's getting low on drones, everybody's getting low on ammunition, and the artillery ammunition in some places of the front is is absolutely uh, dire. I mean, you know, down to one or two rounds they can fire a day almost. Um, and, and still Russia, Russia produces uh, tens of thousands of, of, of rounds of, of, of artillery to fire. Um, so you look at look at those things and, and you could say that uh, Ukraine is on the positive side of the battle. It's not as good as people would have liked it to have been, but it's still on the positive side. So it's positive to Ukraine, negative to Russia at the moment. Um, <clears throat> the strategic attacks with missiles, this is different uh, because what, what Russia has started to do is to try and identify where the air defence systems are, uh, uh, and this could be this could be the prelude to something more dramatic. 
uh, in strategic terms, but, uh, you know, attacks on attacks on energy systems or even attacks on on other things that they haven't tried before. Um, but but the fact that someone in the background is actually thinking about what they're doing uh, almost for the first time in the war is a bit worrying. Um, so and, and one thing I would uh, finish on the sort of summary is that that it's clear that Russia is learning lessons. Um, and and uh, at the strategic level, they are learning lessons, even if they do have to obey what they're told to do and some things are stupid. But generally, overall, they seem to be grasping what they're doing and making changes. And this is this is fundamentally different from a year ago, for example, when they, they, they were, didn't seem to be learning anything. Um, but they definitely are now. And that's a worry. Um, and and it, it, it probably means that that a lot of the, um, as we know, a lot of the senior officers, the peacetime senior officers have been killed off or removed. And we now have people who are just wartime and who are who are actually who are actually doing things. But we have not done that in Ukraine. We haven't removed the peacetime officers. Um, so there are still a lot of things that are being done that uh, are don't reflect the, the war as it really is, don't reflect the reality as it is. Um, so uh, will Russia regain the initiative? It, it will be a resource battle. If it's a resource battle over the winter, then it's quite possible they will. Um, but they won't if they keep fighting stupidly in places like Avdiika, because they'll just use up too many soldiers. So we wait and see what happens. Uh, Mr. Grant, uh, last year in November, approximately in November, we discussed the possible future offensive of Russia. And uh, right now we uh, see the activ activization on, on different battlefields. And do you think that Russia is still ready for a big offensive or, or it is impossible for example, for for nearest it, it's, half it's, year. I mean, if you it, when you start talking about an offensive like this, but basically it depends upon the other side. It depends upon the defense, and Ukrainian defense is very stubborn, uh, uh, and, and uh, people are not giving in. So, so Russia has got a real uh, a real task. Where if it wants to uh, to drive forward anywhere, it's got a, a major task because it has to get through the. The, the, the hardness of the Ukrainian defense, that the problem may come only if Ukraine suddenly runs out of ammunition and, and then they just can't fight. Uh, and that is that is that is a real risk. Uh, you know, it is a real risk. I mean, Russia is also getting more drones uh, and more more uh, equipment from from other countries. So the, 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 there runs the risk that even though the soldiers are terrible, on the Russian side, they're untrained. They're just, they're just, uh, you know, meat as they, as people call them. Um, you know, if they, if they, if that meat comes up against something that can't fight, cannot fight, then then the the the, the thing could change. But then I don't see that Russia has got great capacity for moving forward in any clever way. Um, and if they did break through, then I think there would suddenly be another resurgence of volunteering because there are still a lot of volunteers in the background um, in, in different places, different, you know, Lviv and 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 uh, Lviv and, and Kiev, who would then have to change their back into uniform out of out of working clothes and actually go and do something and would do so. So there's still capacity in the Ukrainian system although it's not well used and it's not well trained, the, the human capacity is still there. Uh, Mr. Grant, I know that you is a very good expert in Ukrainian army. I know that you know the situation in Ukrainian army very good. And as I understand, many change <coughs> during this year and a half. Uh, what what do you think how Ukrainian army change? What we need to change more? 
what 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 is our successful um, you know reforms in army and what what we what we need to do to be successful i i, I mean the the biggest thing that needs to happen is is people have got to listen to the front line in other words it's it's we've got to we've got to to become the same as nato countries where the man at the front is king not the king at the back and the, and the serfs at the front but the king at the front and the serfs behind who serve the king because the man who's actually going to die it should be the king not anybody else you know i don't care about any general walking around they can be as clever as they want to but but their job is to serve the front is to give the front what the front needs and to ensure that the front can fight properly i will give you an example of the stupidity that we've had is that a friend of mine is in a, a unit near Kherson, and one of the inspecting generals, of which there seemed to be um, a bottomless amount of inspecting generals and colonels, turned up and told the unit who were looking over the river, you need to go and find boats because you're going to have to attack across the river. Well, that is as, uh, that's a criminal offence for, for a general to say that. It's the job of the general to find the boats for those soldiers. And to turn up with boats, to turn up with artillery ammunition, to turn up with new guns, with mortars. That's his job. And until we actually get out of this, uh, you know, the front line is meat. And it's still there. There are still people who treat it like this and start listening to the, the people who are fighting and the very clever IT guys who know how to do, how to use drones more effectively, who know how to to do better coordination with with things like the electromagnetic spectrum we've got some very clever people but they are not being listened to in other words they are separate from the system the system is is like a you know a block and outside of that block are clever people and those clever people are not being used in fact it's the reverse of not being used they're almost being punished for being clever uh, and that that's the biggest change once you get the change of that the man at the front is king and people start listening to what he says and fixing what he wants so that he can fight, things can change dramatically. We would we will break through and we will move much, much quicker. Um, and that's it, really. It's it's just it's a fundamental mental change still that is required. Uh, we have a problem with weapons. Uh, right now, and I remember that last year we we not receive enough weapons to yeah. continue our offensive. It was last year, and Russia have possibility to create all these you know defense lines, mm -hmm. and Russia was ready for our offensive. And what we worried about right now is that. In this year, we will receive the same situation. Where yeah, we... I, I think you're right to worry. And I think it's 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 quite possible that it will be the same. In fact, it's possible that it will be worse. Uh, and, and this is why the government has got to stop messing around and has got to start identifying what it can produce and produce quickly. I mean, there are certain weapons. I mean, we've produced mortars before. They were They were garbage. They were bad. But they were bad because they used the wrong steel. Uh, we could produce the same mortars now using proper steel. So, you know, Ukron Brom Prom, I'm sorry, but I, I don't know what it does. Uh, it might be doing lots of things in secret, but nobody's seen that. It's certainly not producing lots of drones and it's certainly not producing mortars and mortar ammunition and things like this. So the government has got to look at what weapon systems can be produced quickly, what can be produced in garages. And then it's got to enable people to do that. We're not only are we not enabling, we're actually still putting um, still putting problems on import uh, for for some for some goods, which actually you know are needed. There is no there is no uh, coherence in this producing of weapons, and that's got to happen because you cannot expect the international community to to, to keep giving everything it's got all the time. Uh, it, because it's not going to happen because they, they will reach a point with different countries where they say, OK, we cannot give any more because otherwise, otherwise we haven't got any. And hey, 
Latvia has already reached that stage and gone beyond it. It's given you all the, all the air defense weapons and all its anti-tank weapons. You can't ask more than that. And, and you know, this, uh, Estonia has given dramatic amounts of, of equipment compared to its size. So, <clears throat> you know, there's there's that, that that has got to be understood that this may actually not get better and that the government has got to actually to work out what it does, not just begging for more and asking for more, but actually starting to produce more. I mean, hey, you know, Ukraine is a big country. It's a big country. It's the same size of population, effectively, as Britain was during the Second World War. And we produced, you know, masses of equipment and tanks and things like this. So there is no reason that Ukraine cannot do the same. This is a management problem. And it's a man and it's also a political will problem. So instead of what, you know, rushing around talking about as, as people talk about, you know, building more roads or spending money on 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 g gymnasiums and things, focus the money on on production, on, on engineering and production. There are brilliant people in Ukraine who can do it. They just need the support of government and the money. Focus the money onto the right places and the results will come. It's Mr. a management problem. Sorry, go on. No, 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 so, so. Uh, it. Uh, Mr. Grant, uh, last uh, last year, I think, we discussed with you, uh, is, it, is Russia ready for long bloody war? And you say that Russia is ready. But if, you, if I ask you this question right now, do you think that Russia is ready for a long bloody war? And how Russia is ready? Well, the government certainly is. I mean, Putin and, and his henchmen certainly are ready for a long bloody war. <clears throat> and they are focusing the money very hard onto production for, for weapons and, uh, and systems. And they are recruiting steadily uh, to increase the, si increase the size of the army. And if you look, you know, there are still lots of soldiers coming to the front front line with equipment and, and weapons and everything else. And there's still ammunition coming. So, and the fact that they are, you know, creating relationships with North Korea, talking to China, talking to Iran, tells me that they're not, they're not about to stop. So we have to, we have to assume that this is not going to be over in a short time and, and, and plan accordingly. Plan the money, plan the, I mean, Ukraine is not on a wartime economy. Yes, that's it. That's it. It's not. And it, and there's no evidence that anybody in the government is even thinking about that. At all. I don't see any evidence of it. I don't hear any evidence of it. I don't see that in Parliament. I don't see any evidence that Parliament is focused on the laws that it needs to put things into a into a wartime frame. At all. And that should worry people. Do you think that the war on the Middle East could change something? Um, I've been asked this question a lot the last week. <laughs> yeah, so, I know, I know. And it's it's an interesting question. I think less perhaps than than people uh, uh, less perhaps direct effect on Ukraine than people think because because the 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 the. the the sort of the things that Israel wants are not necessarily the things that Ukraine needs. So I don't think that, you know, weapons and heavy ammunition are going to be thrown all towards uh, Israel because it's already got lots of things that, that in this respect that it needs for this war. It would change if uh, the war suddenly became hot with Hezbollah and Iran, and that would change things altogether. Uh, they would change things for the world, not just for Ukraine. Um, so I don't think in that respect it's going to uh, change things. What it does do, of course, is it removes um, some of the time that people might have spent on Ukraine uh, onto things for the Middle East. Although that is primarily an American problem, it's less uh, it's less of a problem for for other countries because they will not be spending huge amounts of time in cabinet meetings talking about the Middle East. <clears throat> they'll, they'll have already done what they're going to say, and now they'll just carry on. But America will still have to talk 
And that that time is precious because there's only 24 hours in the day. You know, you can only work 15, 16 hours a day. Uh, and, uh, you know, at, at President Biden's age, I'm sure he doesn't want to work more than 10 or 12 um, or maybe even less. So that that starts putting pressure on time. And that that means decision making becomes a bit sharper and perhaps less thought out just because time is time is precious. Um, and that, that is bound to have a bit of an effect. Um, but it might on the on the other hand, it might also be to a good thing for Ukraine because it's possible that then people say, right, we've got to finish this. Whereas Ukraine was a bit like a a, um, a bad toothache that's not bad enough enough to go to the dentist, but enough to keep taking the tablets. Um, now, possibly, you know, with toothache on both sides, it may actually say, oh shit, we've got to go to the dentist. We've got to get this fixed. I don't know which way this will go. I can't see at the moment. I can't hear from, you know, reading things and listening to things that that, that there's a clear decision yet still in America about we've got to kill this problem. I know Biden said, you know, this is a big problem, but let's see the, the, let's see the, the results of that speech um, and see whether that, that starts to come into something real um, in, the, uh, in the coming weeks. Mr. Grant, uh, let's back to the Ukraine. What is your expectation for, for nearest months? Do you think that this winter uh, company will be slow and offensive will stop, or you expect it that offensive will continue? Uh, or what, what do you think? Uh, how weather could influence for the situation? And yeah. next question: What do you think that, um, for example, in spring, if we receive F-16s, for example, yeah, <laughs> maybe that's a, that's every, a... everything will be changed. You know. Uh, I don't think so, but okay. Let, let, let's come back to the um, let's come back to the winter. I think that the lesson has been learnt from last year that we can't give uh, Russia the time to, to 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 build more defenses in the winter, and that people have got to keep moving forward. And I said last winter, and I, and I, I, I still I still stick by what I said is that we shouldn't have stopped. We should have kept going because Russia is going to be worse in the winter than it is in the summer. Because the, 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 the soldiers are not well looked after in terms of food and water and things like this. So they, they, they actually are in a weaker condition during winter months than, than the Ukrainians are. I mean, I think that Ukrainian soldiers can be, especially if, if the government says to, to society, support them properly, you know, with food, water and everything else, then, then Ukrainians, Ukrainian soldiers in the front line will be supported better. Um, no question about that. Uh, and I think that, the, you know, hard, hard, motivated and intelligent Ukrainian soldiers pushing forward, even in shitty weather, have got even in some ways an even better chance of breaking the front line than they have during the during the summer, um, because it's easier for the Russians in the summer than it is in the winter. Soldiers will not be happy if it drops to minus 15 and nobody feeds them, Russian soldiers. So, so you know, my, my plea is don't stop. Whatever you do, don't stop. Just keep pushing forward where you can, because that's, that's and the, be the worse the weather, the better it is for, 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 for Ukrainian infantry on foot to get in there and, and actually, you know, destroy people. Do you think that F-16 could, change oh. everything or oh, it would be a game it, changer you know it depends how it's used it depends how it's used i mean it, 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 it's if it's used strategically uh as as probably it's most likely to be used um for for putting putting weapons deep into the rear area and things like this it could slow things down for russia and it could make a major problem i think it, it will be in many ways, most effective if it's used close to the front line to actually to break up, <clears throat> to break morale. Um, because at the moment, the, the, the air battle, the air battle is is to the benefit of, of, of Russia on the front line, not. And if we could change that 
then hey, you know, anything that changes the morale of the the Russian soldiers on the front line is to the benefit of Ukraine. So it's it's a, it's got to be used to break morale, not just to break to to slow down resources. Because we've seen we've been slowing down resources solidly now for three or four months, and still half the Ica is being invaded by hundreds and hundreds of soldiers. So that that strategy is working to a degree, but it's still not. Um, it's still not actually stopping Russia doing what it wants to do. So we have to break. We have to break the front line. There is no way. There's the only way to win a war is to break and get behind. There is no other. You can't. You can't degrade Russia on resources. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. They'll just keep finding shit. Even if their lorries are 70 years old, they'll still keep coming. And that means we have to fire and use am precious ammunition on on killing, you know, thousands of rabbits, if you want to look at it like that. Um, and the ammunition just gets worn away on our side. So, you know, the the only way is is breaking through and and exploiting. And every every military doctrine says you have to do that. Every time Russia has been beaten, that is how it's happened. Whether that was, you know, G German battles, <clears throat> German Russian battles, you know, on the steppes in, you know, towards Moscow, or whether it was the Polish war, Polish Russian war, got to get behind them. When you're behind Russian soldiers, they don't like it because it brings uncertainty. Russians hate uncertainty. When you fight them face to face, you have certainty. You know where the enemy is. You have to be, they have to not know where the enemy is. So we have to use F-16 to create a breakthrough. That's that's the strength for it. One big focus, smash somewhere and, and, and get behind them. Mr. Grant, there was a big expectation uh, on in the West for Ukrainian offensive. Do you think that the tactic of Ukrainian army was right? Uh, because many foreign experts expected that Ukraine will use big forces in one place to make breakthrough. But we use absolutely another tactic, yeah? Small groups and, you know, in different parts of the front line and other, other. What do you think? This was a mistake or no? Very difficult to say. <clears throat> because it's it's impossible to actually to understand what is going on at the front with so little information coming back. Um, you know, we can only pick up what people write about when they do write it. Um, the, the West expected, a, 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 you're right, a strong, powerful breakthrough. Um, and there, there was, a, 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 that was only tried in one or two places. And even then it wasn't a strong, powerful breakthrough. You, you'd have needed to have, have put all the mine, mine sweeping um, things together. But you see the mistake, if, if there was a mistake, the mistake was to create new units. That was the mistake. What we should have done is taken units like 93 Brigade that have already done this business once successfully and split them in two. In other words, made two brigades, 93 Brigade Alpha and 93 Brigade Bravo with the same commanders and the same teams in both and given them new soldiers. Because that is historically the lesson learnt that you do not create new units without in that in that form. Um, and, and that's a lesson from First and Second World War. You do two, you do two things. You either split in, in that way or, or or the second one is that you you take back commanders, uh, a heavy amount of commanders and, and senior people and feed them into another unit to make a unit that's still got experienced command. But if you've got inexperienced command and in, inexperienced soldiers, there is no way you can break through. It's just you don't have enough. Um, you don't have enough trust. You don't have enough cord. You don't have enough battle skills. Um, I, I, I'm not sure, and I can't say for sure whether rehearsals were done. But but before the Battle of El Alamein, for example, in the desert, then Montgomery pulled out each brigade one at a time, and rehearsed their role for the attack. So they actually had a sort of like a three-day exercise where they went back. And then they rehearsed it, talked it through. So all the soldiers knew exactly what they had to do and what they were going to do and, and, and in, in each phase of the battle. And then they went back in and waited for, for, the, for the major attack. Um, 
and I don't think that that rehearsals were done in the in the same way. Um, I'm I'm willing to be proven wrong. Someone can come back later and say, yes, we did. We went on the training area and we rehearsed how to break through the mines and and everything else. But but you know, but to have un, basically new commanders uh, with new new troops is really really difficult. So I think that they should have used the experience. Um, the experienced troops much better. I mean, uh, and and perhaps looked at taking, you know, complete 93 Brigade, uh, 24 Brigade back to England and actually equipped them with new equipment and then brought them back again. Because I think then you would have seen a completely different attack on the front line um, from, from what we saw. Um, and uh, that's that that is my thought so you know it's very but it is very difficult uh, you know i would someone will tell me well if we'd taken those out the front line would have collapsed well that's that's a that's a battle decision there are still territorial units that haven't been deployed who could have been put into defense for 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 for, for two months or three months um you know dig trenches put them in defense and just accept accept what happens with that um, but it's, it, again, I'm not there. I'm not the commander. The commanders make the decisions. Um, but I still think that, 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 in my own view, that, that we should have used experience better um, with, 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 the, with the, the units and produce better training for, for them before they went in. Better training on what they actually had to do, not what UK said they should do or what you know Germany said they should do, but what the commanders who are there, about the brigade commanders, sh should have been saying what people are going to have to do because they've been the ones that are, are there fighting. Back uh, to the, the front. Mr. Grant, uh, let's speak a little bit about Russia's army. Uh, do you understand uh, the strategy of Russia's army right now? Uh, what I mean, do you think that, I, I don't know, for example, Russia's army try to be ready for big offensive or try to to build some defense line or do do you understand what 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 they want? Yeah, I mean, I think what they want is political rather than military, uh, and I think what we're looking at is is that you know <clears throat> that, that they want um, that they want the, the the you know the Donetsk territory complete and uh, Luhansk complete. Um, and probably everything, maybe someone's still got an ambition of everything up to the river. Uh, hard, it's hard to say, but clearly, clearly they are still under uh, extreme pressure to to actually to 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 do something successful. Um, and and I'm sure that that Putin is being lied to uh, on a regular basis because the Russian army is 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 not an army of truth. Um, so he's being told, you know, I mean, you, you, I think you may have seen sort of Shoigo's words last week uh, where, where he said, you know, everything is, is as expected, <laughs> which I thought yeah. was, a, you know, was a wonderful expression. Um, it means, means we're losing, but we're not telling you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think that, you know, their, their, their whole battle is, is based upon the political drive to actually to take just take more ground and to keep and to maybe now maybe now just to wear down ukraine to wear it down to to outlive western resources to outlive ukrainian resources to outlive the number of you know the ability to actually to fight and if we get into that battle then you know it's hey it's going to be hard because russia has got a huge resources to do this still uh, in terms of manpower and nothing else, uh, and B, it's got history behind it that we can do this, and that's a that's a very powerful tool for Russia, is to have history. You know, we did this in the Second World War, and that inspires everybody. This is how we do. We just all go and fight for our, for the motherland, and we keep going. And that, and Putin is playing on that at the moment. Putin is playing on that. But um, Mr. Grant, if it is, uh, you know political, uh, more, more, more policies than military, yeah? Mm. It means it, it, it must be a good 
news for Ukrainian army because if you know decision is more political, political motivated, uh, more a reason for mistake. Yes, I agree. I agree completely. And uh, uh, and I mean, you know, all these troops that have been fighting around Avdika. I mean, I mean, three, four brigades they've lost. If they'd have piled those into us in the south, we wouldn't be going uh, even as quick as even as slowly as we are at the moment. Or if they put those against the, the troops in Kherson, it would have been a different reaction. So, so yes, I mean, it is to our benefit that they are making uh, that they're fighting on 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 a political baseline, not on a on a good military baseline. Because I think they would have done something different. Uh, do you think that Russia Russia's army is uh, um, more adaptive than? last year, for example. I know that you say at the beginning of your interview today about that, but yeah. let's yeah, speak about a little bit about Russian army as well. I think it's, 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 I think it's more adaptive at the, at the operational level uh, when they're allowed to be. But down at the tactical level at the moment, I mean, it's, it's, it's um, I, well, my, mo most of my, most of my ex-military colleagues who are looking at, looking at the videos are just uh, flabbergasted at the stupidity of the soldiers. But then you see, they're not trained. They're not trained, and and a, a lot of them are are just you know just ordinary boys out of the village, so to speak. You can't expect them to do anything. I mean, their only military training they've seen is is you know Terminator Two, and uh, you know your average your average war film, uh, and probably Russian war films at that. Um, so you, 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 they've got no understanding of what they're doing, and you can see that, and that that's to our advantage, um, thankfully. But there's still, you know, there's still these signs that, that, that there is adaptation in different places and learning, and in in terms of things like you know use of drones, use of electronic warfare, use of aircraft. So we shouldn't be too uh, too complacent, one should say. Um, this is, you know, there's always that chance that the adaptation will be, will be, will be really potent in some place, and it is with the drones in some places, where they just don't allow people to move. Mr. Grant, I expected a, a hot winter. I mean, on the battlefield in in Ukraine. Yeah. Yes. I. I mean, I. I, I think so. Uh, and and. I think that you know Russia can't afford to stop. You know they were lucky; they had no choice last winter because, to be blunt, that we'd beaten them, um, and uh, we gave them that opportunity to, to to bring in reserves and to sort themselves out. And that was a mistake. No question, that was a mistake. Uh, they were beaten after Kherson, um, and, uh, and and now. Now they've revitalized, and I think that they will keep going through the winter. I'd be very surprised if they just dug in. They may, they may just dig in to, to defensive positions for the winter, um, but uh, but we have to wait and see. We have to wait and see, and that will be political again. That will be political. It, it will depend upon whether Putin believes he's got enough uh, credibility from what's happened so far, or whether he needs more. Uh, credibility at home about how well or badly things are going. Mr. Grant, thank you so much to be with us today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.